Good evening and welcome to Open Your Mind Radio. You have myself, Alan James. And you have myself, Stephen George, very, as well. Very good evening. Good evening. Sunday the 30th of December 2012. And not really a good day out. Weather's pretty bad, Steve, isn't it? Uh, well, it is where we are. It's, uh, it's, uh, I won't say it's uh, an apocalypse or anything like that. Uh, but it is, it's, it's raining quite heavily and there's a little bit of flooding going on. Nearly died getting up here, but I got up. You got up. Yeah. Fair play to you. You trooper. What I can did, I say? I yeah. Sleep deprivation and everything. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's, uh, let's go over to the uh, communication channels. Okay, okay. Communication channels, as usual, info at oimireland.com for your emails throughout the show. Uh, we also have the guest book on the website as well, if you want to leave a message there. Um, we also have the chat facility as well. You can log in there, oimireland.com, top left hand corner. You will see live chat. Just click in there. You can, lo- you can register or you can just put in a pseudonym or your real name, whatever. You can join in the chat. You can also pose questions there to us and to our special guest this evening. Or if you fancy uh, giving us a shout on the telephone, you can. Give us a call on 046 0469271212. If you're ringing in from outside of Ireland, it's a 00353 in front of that, Alan. Yeah, so I'm, I say this sleep deprivation because obviously for people who um, don't know, Steve is a new dad for the third time. Yep. And um, he's just getting a few hours sleep, if that. I'm, 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 catching, I'm catching a few Z's in between feeds, yeah. And the matchsticks are, are working wonders holding the eyelids open, yeah? Fantastic, fantastic. Oh, listen, I don't envy it. I've been there. I don't envy it. Um, right, okay, just a couple of things. Our guest on tonight will be uh, Ian R. Crane. Ian is a, an expert when it comes to a lot of information that's going on out there. Um, Ian is an ex-oil executive, a lecturer, writer and broadcasts on the geopolitical webs that are being spun globally. So Ian has been on the show before just for a brief visit. So this is a bit of a longer interview with, with uh, Ian so we can actually um, go through a few bits and pieces with him. Before we bring him on though, there's a couple of things we want to say. Again, thanks for people for the donations coming in. Thanks a lot for clicking on the ads. Uh, everything helps. If you don't have the, uh, the washers, as Harry would say, then by you know, having a look at the ads and clicking on the ads it all helps. A, little bit, a few cents here and there just adds up, so we appreciate that. Now, on the 12th of January, there is a radio marathon from United We Strike. If you pop over to unitedwewin.me, that's the website, unitedwewin.me, you can pop over there for more information, but we hope to be on that on January 12th, maybe even producing it. I don't know, we'd probably be involved with doing some production with it as well. But as you know, the marathon involves globally a lot of radio stations and a lot of broadcasters and a lot of guests. And it happens every every month, um, and we the, the word gets out there. So you know to get involved, if you um, if you want to um, get involved and you know ring in and jump on the chat facility and leave messages or talk to the guest that's on, by all by all means do that. As I say, it's Saturday, January the twelfth. Now, Steve, you can talk about the third one if you want. Yeah, we had a, a bit of a chuckle about this one during the week. Uh, we're not kind of sure if it's actually genuine or not. But uh, if you want to know if you're if you're making an impact in the world, well then, uh, you know this this is, might be a way of finding out. But we got an email during the week uh, from a company asking if would if we would be interested in selling OYMIreland.com. Apparently, we match all their requirements, we tick all their boxes, and they want to know if we're interested in selling. Now, this is not the domain name they're after. They're actually after the website itself. Yeah. So. Um, they haven't mentioned a figure yet, have they? Well, I, I sent them an email. I'm not saying that we're looking to sell, but I've said that, you know, we've put in a lot of work over the last two and a half years on the website. And, you know, if they, if they did turn around and, and say a very small amount, we wouldn't be interested. But out of curiosity, we just want to see how much they would offer. Um, so, as, as Steve said, we match their, the criteria they're looking for on a website, whatever that criteria may be. So we've sent off an email anyway of interest to see what they want to do. So I'd be just curious. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, let, let's let's say for argument's sake you had a, a big a big website that was getting a lot of hits and it was sharing a lot of information. What what best what, what best way to get rid of it than to buy it? Well, I mean, this, what do you think about this it? is the other this is the other thing I was thinking of. Yeah. You know, we did talk about this that it could be something else to it. So anyway, 
Um, we'll see what happens. We'll keep you posted and, and let you know. Well, so we're we'll probably not for sale. <laughs> no, we're, exactly. We're, we're not for sale. I don't think so. No. Right, Steve. How's your week? Apart from sleep deprivation, <laughs> no, I, my course, week's anyway. been fine. My week's been fine. As I said to you before we came on live, um, I have... B- I have been catching up on a couple of videos during the week. There was one you sent out there uh, from Bill Maloney, Bill, good guy, Poem Ash Films. And uh, I've, I think it's about an hour and a bit. I've watched so far about 10, maybe 12 minutes, and it's paused at home on, on the computer. I'm finding that because the baby is, is, is keeping us awake a bit during the night, that uh, anything that's over maybe 15 minutes long, uh, I, I, just kinda, I tune out after a while. So... Uh, you know, I'm kind of just watching small films. That said, I th- I kind of have, probably like yourself, because of the week that's been in a Christmas week, I've been kind of focusing more on family than I have on, you know, kind of trying to heal the world. I know that's an important task as well, and there's a lot of other people that's doing a sterling job. Uh, but I just felt the week that was in it, family deserved more of my attention. So with that, I've I've, I've only kind of watched a couple of uh, information videos that have been kind of going around in relation to that shooting, the, the Sandy the Sandy Hook shooting. Uh, there's there's a lot of kind of indiscrepancies. A lot of people saying that it, it's not what it seems. It's a false flag. And although, as we we think we said last week, we don't want to make light of anything where children died or anyone died for that matter. But it is kind of interesting when you see different takes on and you know some of the interviews, some of the people who were actually interviewed and. They were supposed to be grieving. There may be different people grieve in different ways, but just it, it didn't kind of add up. Um, there was just a lot of dots, and maybe in time when we when when the dots the the, the, the dots get joined, it might make a bit more sense. But uh, yeah, as as, as uh, Johnny just posted there, weren't they all actors? Don't know. I can't I can't answer that. But from from what I've I've seen and what I've heard, it it, it sounded and seemed like uh, a stage production. So, as I say, we're not making, me personally, I'm not making light of the situation, I'm sure. If if it is, as we were told, it, it's an atrocity and, you know, maybe uh, it's something that needs to be addressed. But from what I heard, one chap was actually saying that uh, a lot of the children, when they were getting interviewed, that one of the first things coming out of their mouths, not that they were scared, witless or... Uh, anything but the first thing coming out of their mouths was that oh uh, uh, we need gun control we need gun control you know as as the old saying goes and I think it's something we've said before guns don't kill people people kill people the same as I mean when you think about it here in Ireland every Christmas you hear about all the fatalities over the Christmas period you know people who are killed on the roads in their cars but we're not starting the campaign to ban cars Exactly. You know. Exactly. So but that's that's pretty much my week. It was, as I say, it was kind of a family orientated week, and uh, um, hope hopefully everyone, you know, out there who's listening, they all kind of spent t- time with the family. Just took a break from trying to heal the world. How was your week? Well, same as you, Steve. I actually took a back seat, and you know me. You know, I'm like. But I took a back seat as well, and I concentrated on, on the family things that had to be done, and a few other bits and pieces. So again, like Steve, catching up on a few things, a few videos to watch. But obviously focused on the family, being that it's Christmas and all that kind of stuff. So um, we're just getting back in the chair now, and we're just going to, you know, get stuck in for 2013 and basically see what happens. I think I think we just that that's really going to be it. But we want to bring our guest in, Ian, because Ian's going to be with us till around eight o'clock. So um, without further ado, we'll bring Ian in. Good evening, Ian. How are you doing? Hi guys, I'm uh, real good. Good to uh, good to catch up with you. Excellent, Ian. Thanks for coming on. Um, we've I know you're very busy, and we've 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 been talking to you about getting you on, and you've been travelling around Australia, and you've been doing this, that, and the other, and you're doing a, a phenomenal job getting the information out there. So, and I think people know. I mean, they um, people know Ian Crane. Does it, is there a point going into you know your background because we know. I'm sure people know you, and they know you're an ex-oil uh, oil executive, and you're experienced in that. And obviously, you know, you do the lectures, you do all the tours. But is there anything you want to add to that? Um, no, I think that, I mean, you have uh, people who have access to uh, text or, um, um, or messaging during the show. Yeah, we have a uh, chat facility. We have our users on now. So normally the um, the listeners um, log into the chat facility and they'll ask questions and stuff like that. So, okay, and well, maybe, you know, maybe if there's anything that anybody specifically wants to address, then they could uh, text in or, or, or message in. 
But before we went on air, you, you were um, you were discussing or mentioning the uh, the fact that a number of people felt a little bit disappointed that nothing happened on uh, December twenty first. That's right. Yeah, you want you want to um, uh, explain again what you were, sh- were sharing with me? Yeah, well, we had um, on the twenty first, which was on Friday. Um, there was a group of us got together and we did a radio show, which is myself, Steve, Detlev from Wake News Radio in Switzerland, Karen Quinn Tostado from United We Strike, and JP from Wolf Spirit Radio. And we all got together on the Friday and we all kind of said, you know, what about you? Did anything happen in your country? Did anything happen there? And there was nothing. And then on the Sunday, they all came back on OIM and we asked the same thing again. And the same thing again was nothing happened well when we say nothing happened nothing that we know of happened so I don't know whether you yourself have experienced or have heard of something happening and it wasn't we didn't expect the doom and gloom because that's all just media hype and everything else we knew it wasn't going to be that and but we did you know just expect something maybe maybe an aurora borealis or you know, we we'll talk about this conscious awakening. The, even the Mayan elder was on YouTube talking about this eight minutes of conscious awakening that we're going to experience. And there's also the three days of darkness, which was thrown around for quite a long time. But we didn't expect really any of the doom and gloom stuff. But, we, you know, just something. I don't know. And p- people we spoke to said, no, nope, haven't seen anything, haven't experienced anything, haven't heard anything. So maybe you come across something, Ian. I don't know, Steve? Yeah, just be- before Ian comes in, we did actually hear as well, I think it was mentioned last week, that uh, someone did mention that the Mayans got it wrong and the actual date of this supposed three days of darkness, etc., was 2116. That it was supposed to be a, li- a little bit off. Now, a lot of people are saying, you know, t- 21, 12, 12. Mm-hmm. And then, obviously, when nothing happened, now they're saying, oh, it's 20, 21, 21, 16. <laughs> So we've become very, very sceptical because we've been given dates on a lot of things and nothing nothing has happened. You know, we talked about Nirabu last year and there was other dates thrown around for other things. And, you know, so after all these dates that you get and people talk about things, you just get very sceptical. So I don't know. How do you feel about that, Ian? Well, I think there's a couple of points here. Um, I mean, I, I've certainly made the observation and, uh, I mean, this is on a number of my uh, of my videos that are out there on uh, YouTube, and I, I made the observation, I said that there's a lot of people who you know, may well actually just wake up on December the 22nd and keel over and die <laughs> because they've, they've actually got so much of, or developed so much of an existential attachment to something significant happening on December 21st. Mm. Yet, you know, my, my interpretation was that uh, certainly uh, anybody that was expecting to witness anything um, significant, and unless it was contrived, uh, was uh, was effectively going to be very disappointed. I mean, one of the greatest cons here is to associate the term um, apocalypse with a, a perception that it means Armageddon, when you know nothing could be further from the truth. You know, the the word apocalypse simply means the lifting of the veil, the, the great revealing. And, and I think, you know, this has been going on for some time. I think it's been going on for, um, well, I, I would actually say um, about, a, about 192 years, actually, uh, because I think we can actually trace the, the moment that the great revealing uh, began back to uh, 1820. And we'll come back to that in perhaps just a second. But, you know, this is a, a long process. And the, you know, the Mayan long count, um, which is a 5,125-year cycle, this five Bactun cycle, uh, sorry, 13 Bactun cycle, 5,125 years, um, you know, which, which uh, pointed to this particular juncture. And it needs to be understood that the Mayans are the only ones who had a calendar that was very specific in terms of the, the date, if you like. Um, but there are many, many other... Uh, cultures around the world, you know, ancient indigenous peoples as well as contemporary indigenous peoples that have pointed to this particular juncture in our evolutionary process as, as being significant in terms of a, an evolution of consciousness. But, you know, it, it's not necessarily going to happen for everyone. 
um, and it's not necessarily going to happen at exactly the same pace. So, you know, this is a long game that we're in, and uh, uh, we've, we've still got to be, uh, you know, very focused on, um, on on trying to encourage people to step out of their attachment to the materialist, consumerist construct that's been so brilliantly created uh, and get people to maybe, uh, you know, look a little bit um, deeper at what's occurring here. But, you know, I think that, I, I mean, I think it's very exciting. I mean, I think that, you know, we are seeing this revealing. I think we are seeing the uh, the powers that be, the establishment, whatever you want to call them, actually starting to get very, very nervous. They're looking to accelerate their agenda because they're they're behind schedule because they wanted to have their global government in place by now. Um, and, of course, each time they, uh, they, they try to accelerate their agenda, um, they, they tend to actually have the effect of uh, uh, causing an even larger number of people to actually question what's going on. And you just mentioned Sandy Hook. And, and there are so many anomalies with the, uh, uh, the Sandy Hook event, and as they were with the Aurora event just a few months prior. And, and you know, these, these events in of themselves are actually starting to get people who were resisting questioning things like 9-11 or 7-7 or whatever, uh, because now they're starting to realize that there's just too many um, things that, that just don't stack up with the official version of events. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree. On the Sandy Hook um, side of things, there's so many uh, discrepancies that are going on. It's unreal. And, well, you know, and I think your point was well made. You know, I, I don't profess to know exactly what happened at Sandy Hook any more than I profess to know exactly what happened on 9-11. Mm. But the, you know, the reality is that when people actually start to look at these events for themselves and they start to look at the physical evidence that is in the public domain, they will start to realize that the physical evidence does not actually support the official version of events. Mm. And, and, and I mean, we, if people haven't heard this before, if people are listening to uh, this discussion and they're going, oh, my God, oh, my God, you know, how dare they question um, this tragedy at Sandy Hook? Well, you know, go, start by going to look at or the, um, uh, the interview with the medical examiner, um, because that in of itself is, is actually quite disturbing. Uh, alone the discussions with uh, with some of the parents and the fact that at least one of the children who was listed as um, having been killed in that event um, is, is very clearly alive because she was actually in the photograph taken with Obama just a few days later. So, you know, I, I, I'm not expecting anybody to take what I say at, at face value. And in fact, I'd be mortified if they did. But what I what you know I, I would encourage is people to spend a little bit of time and, and uh, you know taking a look at the the evidence that is freely accessible. You know, just got to Google Sandy Hook anomaly, and uh, you know that there's uh, if they invest just one hour taking a look at some of this stuff, they'll start to see some of the very very disturbing questions that are um, are being raised by the now hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are actually looking at these issues. You know, when in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, there was probably a handful of people across the planet, um, uh, you know, including myself, uh, who were actually looking at this. I mean, which is why it took me seven months. Um, it was April of 2002 when I actually came to the absolute definitive conclusion that this was something other than 19 uh, Arabs wielding plastic box cutters. Uh, you know, because we did have to, you know, literally go but right back to source material. And I say there was literally just a handful of people um, looking at this stuff. Today, it's not a handful. Today, it's hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Mm. Um, now, that doesn't mean to say that, of course, you know, we've still got a hell of a task ahead because the reality is that the majority of people are still locked into, um, you know, the, the construct that's presented by uh, the, uh, the compliant mainstream media. And, and, of course, the role of the mainstream media is literally to tell people what to think, uh, to save them from the, uh, the hassle of actually having to think for themselves and, and, and to encourage them to simply regurgitate the bullshit that is 
is pumped out in the national newspapers or on the um, national TV stations. Mm. The role of the alternative community, on the other hand, is very, very different. You know, the role of the alternative community, and including, you know, what you guys are doing with OIM, is to encourage people to take a look at things for themselves and, and come to their own realization of, uh, of what's occurring. But, you know, you guys, more than anyone else in, in the English-speaking world right now, you know, realizes how difficult this is because, you know, I hate to say it, but the Irish people have, have basically given away their country. Uh, I mean, it, it, it is staggering. And I know that you guys are staggered and there are many, many people in Ireland that are staggered. But the reality is that the vast majority of people in Ireland just can't be asked to, uh, to wake up to, you know, what has occurred over the last uh, five years and, uh, and, and, and have effectively given their country away without a whimper. Well, we agree with you. A DJ affectionately called, it, uh, called people like that NIMBYs, which is not in my backyard. And we, are we a country full of NIMBYs? Well, I think we are. I think people are saying, look, as long as it doesn't affect me, I'm not interested, I'm not bothered. But they don't realise that it will eventually affect them. Now, we, have, we are heavily fluoridated over here, Ian, as you know. And maybe that has something got to do with it. I mean, the whole children referendum thing that went on over here, people were so confused. I mean, the government used 1.1 million of taxpayers' money for um, a biased um, yes vote. And people were so confused, they didn't know what to think. Yes or no, whatever. And they were frightened into voting yes. And, I mean, you've seen the elections that we've had here before. Lisbon 1, Lisbon 2, um, and a few others that, it, you know, it's, it's all kind of biased. And the government doing the marketing and promotion, although they should be sitting on the fence, they're not. And this is why people now, I don't know whether you know in recently, but one of the uh, TDs of the Fine Gael party committed suicide just before Christmas. He, he had three or four children. And yeah. he's actually a, a TD that has a local office where we are located. And that, we don't want to see that. I mean, that's the last thing we want to see. By the end of the day, he was obviously, whatever was going on in his life and the pressure. And, but the media was, were turning around and they were saying things like, um, oh, people were sending in very nasty emails and calling him names and stuff like that. Well, people are angry over here. They're very angry at what's going on. And they're supposed to be representing the people. And I'm just going to pass Sue over to Steve. Steve, you want to... No, I was just going to actually say what, what you just mentioned, that the, the word on the street, I mean, around, I think all the dogs on the street around here uh, have basically said that it was pressure from people is why that guy took his own... I mean, okay, it's, it's sad that he did. I know other people are, are taking their own lives because of the pressure that's that, uh, being put on them by banking institutions. But this local TD, it seemingly, after the referendum, uh, the children's referendum, he was... Uh, well, it was that, plus then they, uh, they had agreed, the government agreed that they were going to cut uh, allowances for carers because uh, obviously the government don't care about, any more, uh, about people who, who are in need of care. So they decided that people who were in care, the, their carers would have their allowances cut and seemingly it was uh, people who were banging on this guy's door, knocking on his door and basically putting their feelings across to him and how, how, how they felt about the whole situation and he obviously couldn't handle the pressure, it was obviously too much for him so he took the uh, I, you'd, you'd wonder was it the easy option, I mean it couldn't have been an easy option mm. but well, it's not, you know, there's obviously a reason why I think the, look sadly the pressure, the pressure uh, you know, he's being blamed on the people. Actually, um, you know, there, there is a distinct possibility the pressure was coming from within his own uh, political party. Mm. You know, because I, I would certainly make the observation that the vast majority of people go into politics with altruistic motives. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, of course, it doesn't take too long for them to realise that they have literally entered a den of absolute thieves and, and socio-psychopaths. And, and either, either they, they roll over and basically get their snouts in the trough and start milking it for everything that's on offer, or they, they start to suffer literally the deep, deep depression of suddenly realising that, you know, that they thought they have entered into politics to represent the electorate, when in reality, the, nothing could be further from the truth. The only way in which a politician stays in office 
is if they prove themselves to be a safe pair of hands and can play the game of charades where they give the impression that they are representing the people, but in reality, they are representing the interests of the global corporatists. Mm. And uh, I think that's why Brian Cowan, um, I mean, it was obviously very common knowledge around Tullamore, that Brian Cowan, in his latter days as uh, Taoiseach, you know, would, would actually get his uh, bodyguards to clear a pub and, um, you know, he would just sort of drink himself into oblivion. And I think that, you know, Cowan realized, uh, certainly uh, by 2010, but probably before, you know, but he realized that he had effectively been manipulated um, in the same way Woodrow Wilson was manipulated in 1913. Cowan had been manipulated, uh, along with Brian Lenihan, into literally handing Ireland over to the global corporatists. And, of course, we can literally trace the exact moment and, uh, and, and I would encourage people to go and uh, check this out for themselves. But the exact moment at which Ireland effectively ceased to exist was uh, the last week of September in 2008. And this was the moment when Cowan and Lenahan were effectively corralled by um, Paul Gallagher. And in my opinion, it's Paul Gallagher who committed the most heinous treason um, against the Irish people because he was the sitting Attorney General and the role of Attorney General in, in any government is to ensure that the government of the day, i.e. The, um, uh, the Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, the Chancellor and all other uh, members of the inner cabinet, it's to ensure that they uphold the law and in this case of course the Irish Constitution. Now um, uh, Paul Gallagher was joined by uh, Dermot uh, Gleeson. And Dermot Gleeson, of course, is a former um, uh, Attorney General, I believe. And um, he is also the former uh, head of Anglo-Irish. Now, there was a third person uh, involved here putting the pressure on um, Cowan and um, Lenahan but I can't prove that he was actually physically present. But his signature is all over this, uh, this particular meeting. And that's a guy who has the audacity to uh, call himself Irish, but he's Irish in, um, uh, by accident of birth only. And, um, and that is the man, and you know who I'm talking about here, I'm sure, Peter Sutherland. Of course, yeah. Peter Sutherland, also a former Attorney General of um, the Irish government, but he was, is, of course, a former EU commissioner. He was the founding director general of the World Trade Organization. He was the uh, chairman of uh, BP. Uh, he's been chairman of Goldman Sachs. And, and, of course, what he, Dermot Gleeson, and, and Paul Gallagher all have in common is that they are all Bilderbergers. Mm. And I, I believe that when they met with Cowan and, um, and Lenihan in, in late September 2008, and they basically told... Um, uh, uh, Cowan and Lenihan that they needed to underwrite all of the assets and liabilities of Irish banks uh, by the Irish taxpayer. Then that was the moment at which um, uh, basically the Irish nation was was condemned. And I can remember that Lenihan basically came out saying, you know, we've taken this decision and it's the cheapest form of bailout. Um, well, <laughs> You know, unfortunately, of course, Lenihan is uh, no longer around to have to um, answer to uh, the, the electorate uh, because uh, tragically he died of uh, pancreatic cancer a couple of years ago. But Cowan, you know, has to, has to live uh, with, with the fact that he was the architect of the, the loss of the Irish nation. And, and basically, Cowan did exactly the same as the Irish government in um, 1800. You know, in 1800, the, uh, the, the nation was effectively handed over to the British bankers because the Irish government uh, and the Irish banks were so indebted to the British banks that they could see no other way out than to dissolve the nation. And so in 1800, the Act of the Union was signed and effectively Ireland ceased to exist. And what happened in the immediate aftermath, of course, was that 
The Irish currency was effectively totally devalued, and the British landowners moved in and bought up uh, Ireland for, for literally cents on the uh, on the punt, pennies on the punt. And, and 40 years later, of course, we had the outrageous travesty, which in, in British history books is, uh, is, is presented as a terrible, terrible uh, famine, where there was no famine in Ireland. You know, we know that thanks to the wonderful research of Raymond Crofty, who, of course, is, was the guy who ensured that the Irish people at least had the opportunity to have referendums, yeah. which is more than any other country in Europe has had. But Raymond Crotty collated the shipping manifests from the major ports in Ireland in the period of the so-called famine. And what was happening was that the British landowners were shipping all of the produce out of Ireland because they were going to make much more profit by selling it elsewhere in the rapidly developing British Empire than they were by selling it to the, the people of Ireland. So consequently, the, the population of Ireland um, were left to starve because there was indeed uh, potato blight. And, and unfortunately, of course, that was pretty much all that they were left to eat by their genocidal British landowners. And so they either starved or, of course, had to uh, uh, take passage across the Atlantic, which is why if you go to St. John's in Newfoundland, I mean, St. John's in Newfoundland is more Irish than most Irish towns right now. You know, because the people that uh, were forced to uh, leave Ireland, you know, against their, their will, basically, but if they didn't, they were going to starve, uh, and they got off the ships at first landfall, and, and that was St. John's. So, you know, what we're going to see is, is a repeat of history. Because, and the Irish nation, unfortunately, is sleepwalking into yet another bout of genocide. I mean, in the first instance, of course, many, many young people in Ireland are, are moving out of the country. I mean, you, you just mentioned that, uh, you know, I was in Australia and New Zealand a few weeks ago, and when I was in Australia and New Zealand, I met many, many young people from Ireland who have left the country to basically seek their uh, their fortune elsewhere because you know there was nothing for them in the uh, in the home co in the home country, um, and so you know Ireland is losing its its young people again. I know it's been through this sort of uh, you know many times. And, and this is exactly what the global corporatists want. I mean, basically, they, you know, what is happening right now is, is it's a little more subtle than the potato famine issues of um, 1840. But Ireland is effectively being depopulated. And the, and the primary reason is that the global corporatists are desperate to get their hands on this real estate for two reasons. Um, number one is that Ireland, of course, because of its uh, position, geographical position, actually sits with territorial waters that account for 23% of the total fishing waters within the EU. And so Ireland should be able to, or should be relatively wealthy, just in terms of selling, you know, give or take about a quarter of the, the fish stock to the EU nations, but it's not, because what happened is a few number of years ago, the corrupt politicians sold 19% of Ireland's 23% of uh, EU fishing waters for a one-off payment of six billion. So Ireland, you know, no longer has access to uh, to 19%. I, I basically, you know, 19% of the 23%. So, you know, no, Ireland no longer has access to about 90% of its fishing stocks. Um, coupled with which, there are massive hydrocarbon reserves in the Loch Allen Basin. And I, I, I'm sure, I, I mean, I tried to talk about this issue, you know, a couple of years ago when I was touring Ireland with, um, uh, well, both with Jim Corr in 2010, and also when I did a tour of, uh, uh, of Ireland in the middle of 2011. And certainly in the 2011 tour, I was trying to explain to people that, you know, what was potentially coming down the, uh, the pipeline, no pun intended, with the, um, uh, the introduction of, uh, of fracking in the Loch Allen Basin, which of course covers about six counties right in the heart of, uh, of Ireland and actually goes across into County Fermanagh, in Northern Ireland, and, and the global corporatists wanted to get their hands on Ireland before the people of Ireland realised that 
they had the potential um, to become one of the wealthiest nations within the EU. Because in addition to the Loch Allen Basin, which is certainly the low-hanging fruit as far as the hydrocarbons industry is concerned, uh, in addition, of course, within Irish territorial waters are enormous reserves of hydrocarbons. Now, they're not in the most um, hospitable of waters because most of it sits about 200 miles or so offshore. Um, I, I mean, uh, of course, uh, everyone's familiar with uh, Shell's activity up in the in the northwest of the country mm. and, and the nightmare that uh, that has been forced upon the people of, of that part of the country. Well, you know, what people have had to endure from Shell shipping uh, or, or bringing it um, gas on land is going to be nothing compared to what the people who live in the centre of the country have to endure when the, the fracking activity starts there because potentially uh, and of course we face the same issue in um, potentially in the UK although fracking uh, uh, there's only two frack jobs that have been run in the UK and both have resulted in uh, minor earth tremors so right now although on December the 17th the British government lifted the moratorium on fracking but at least there's, uh, you know, a tremendous level of awareness. And in fact, I'm just about, uh, within the next week or so, to launch a, uh, a new website called frackingnightmare.com, <laughs> where, we're going to, we where we're going to literally collate uh, a lot of information from around the world, particularly the US and in Australia, where fracking has been going on for some time, where whole tracts of land and the water within or underneath that land has effectively been poisoned to the point where the land has become uninhabitable to both man and beast. And the land won't even sustain crops because the water supply has been poisoned. So, you know, I mean, on a global basis, we are facing uh, um, uh, a potential genocide here as the global corporatists uh, seek to accelerate the, um, the amount of uh, hydrocarbons they're able to extract from the, sh the shale deposits uh, regardless of the cost to all life, not just human life here, but all life. So, you know, the Irish people, um, I mean, for, forgive my French, but, you know, uh, it, it's been a travesty, an absolute travesty, to see the, the Irish people basically give away their country for the second time in 212 years. This time it's been a little bit more subtle, perhaps. But nonetheless, the effect has been exactly the same. And, and my prognosis, unfortunately, is that it's not going to take 40 years this time. I, I think that we're going to see in the next decade or so um, a level of devastation uh, in, in Ireland that uh, is, is currently beyond people's comprehension as, as a massive chunk of the country effectively becomes uninhabitable. I think we're getting there now, Ian, the way things are at the moment. Ian, I know we're limited on time and questions are coming in from our listeners. So, Steve, you want to um, start throwing over the questions for, for Ian and um, we'll, uh, we'll uh, get to you. One of the, do you, do you have it? I have, I have one here. It's kind of, it's, it's off topic uh, about what we're speaking about, Ian, but it's a question from Johnny. It came in there a few minutes ago and he wants to know, can we ask Ian about the plan to legalise paedophilia and Harriet Harman's part in that? Well, absolutely. Um, I mean, once again, it's a great question, and, and it's wonderful to hear that question being asked because it means that there are people out there who are starting to realise that um, this uh, agenda to legalise paedophilia, and I, uh, listen, um, I don't want people to uh, misunderstand what I'm saying here because I'm certainly not casting any aspersions um, against the gay community. But, you know, just as 30, 40 years ago, um, you know, what we saw, obviously, was a mega push towards a greater acceptability of homosexuality. And, and so today, obviously, what we have is, is effectively within the Western world, uh, we've reached a point where, you know, homosexuality and, uh, um, you know, uh, same-sex relationships, even same-sex marriages, are, are acceptable. Um, but 40 and certainly 50 years ago, you know, that was an absolute no-go area. I mean, it was a subject that many people regarded as abhorrent. Well, you know, we're in a very similar situation right now with paedophilia. And, and certainly um, uh, the ultimate goal is, and Harriet Harman, of course, and her relationship with the Pedophile Information Exchange, 
the ultimate goal is to re- reduce the age of consent. I mean, you know, the irony is, I mean, let's not so forget that the age of consent in the Vatican is 12. This yeah. is the Vatican. Mm. The age of consent is 12. Now, there's not that many women who live in Vatican City, so, um, you know, I, I guess it becomes any port in a storm. But uh, the ultimate goal here is not just to reduce the age of consent, but ultimately to abolish it. And I, and I think if, once again, I would encourage people to do their own research, but if they start to take a look at some of the stuff that is migrating into the mainstream media, and it's all part, it's all part of the, the programming for people to uh, accept um, uh, sex with, uh, with children. You know, I mean, we're starting to see an increasing amount of media and, uh, and, and even, uh, you know, Hollywood production that are... Um, making the unthinkable thinkable. I mean, what, I know it's slightly uh, different, but uh, you know, one of the incredible uh, coincidences is that the author of The Hunger Games, which of course is a um, book and a, and a recent film, which, which presents the unthinkable, i.e. of children killing children uh, for the entertainment of the, uh, of the ruling elite. And, and, and her, her, her place of residence is Sandy Hook in Connecticut. I'll just let that sink in. <laughs> I mean, you know, mm. this, is, this is what uh, we're seeing. Is it's all part of an agenda to make the unthinkable thinkable. And once it becomes thinkable, it actually becomes a possibility. Well, it goes back to the uh, totalitarian tiptoe. And they're gra- going to bring it in gradually. I remember... About probably about two years ago, I was um, sent over an email of an article over in Germany where they were saying that, oh, it's okay to do this to your kid and that to your kid and that to your kid. And they're trying to, again, bring out the uh, pedophilia and say that it's it's normal to do this stuff. And this was about two years ago, and they're just doing no, that. Well, two years ago, it was actually, I, uh, I discussed this in um, a presentation that I recorded called um, uh, The Truth Agenda, uh, The Truth Injection. The truth injection, mm. um, and I recorded that in 2009. And in, in that presentation, yes, I discussed a, a pamphlet that was published in Germany. Now, actually, by the time that I recorded the presentation, um, I was assured that the pamphlet was no longer available within Germany. It had been withdrawn, but it was actually still available in parts of Switzerland, in the German-speaking part of Switzerland. And in this pamphlet, it it actually promoted the idea of parental stimulation of uh, their children's... Um, uh, 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 I mean, it talks about fathers stimulating the, uh, the clitoris of, of their daughters, their young daughters, because it, in, it, it helped in the bonding. Yeah, that's I mean, right. Yeah. This, this is the sort of absurdity that um, is being presented as a norm. And, and like you said, it, 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 is the, uh, it is the process of gradualism. Mm. You know, it floats the idea. Of course, it gets knocked back. <coughs> but nonetheless, the seed is sown. Yeah. And then they'll come back a few years later and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, don't be at all surprised. We've, we've seen in 2012 with the release of The Hunger Games, we've seen, you know, a film that uh, effectively glamorizes children killing children. Um, and, and, of course, the, it is the weaker and the younger children who get killed first. It don't be at all surprised if we start to see in in the coming uh, year or so films that um, promote the idea of sex with minors. It's um, it, it wouldn't surprise I me. Don't, I think I think we we had Brian on a couple of times, Brian Gerrish, and Brian was telling us that that's the last um, uh, the last thing in society that's unacceptable, really, because in the sixties there was homosexuality where it was illegal. And now, the last thing really that people frown upon is paedophilia, but what they're trying to do is get that into the norm. Well, a- absolutely. Um, and, and in fact, I, um, I had an event in, in London a few weeks ago um, called On the Cusp of the Apocalypse. And, uh, and I mean, we made the point there that uh, I made at the beginning of this discussion that, you know, apocalypse certainly does not mean Armageddon, it means the Great Revealing. Now, Brian, Brian gave an absolutely 
superb presentation. I have to say that, I mean, with the exception of me, because I was still jet lagged, that's my excuse. But, I mean, all the other speakers were absolutely on fire. Mm. Uh, and that was Ben Fellows talking about, uh, you know, his experiences with the BBC, uh, the institutional um, paedophilia, and, of course, the institutional denial. Um, but Brian Gerrish gave an absolutely outstanding presentation uh, called The Killing Regime. And, and in that presentation, I mean, he, he pulled no punches at all. Um, and, and he made the observation. He said, look, you know, if anybody is under uh, any illusion that, uh, you know, we are literally now living in a regime where the establishment primarily wants to kill us. Mm. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing this, and, and you touched on it earlier, you know, the, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Uh, benefits mean that, uh, you know, more and more people are being forced into, in, into poverty. And there is no explanation. I mean, one of the great clips that people can find for themselves on, uh, on YouTube is uh, Vincent Brown actually uh, in a press conference with a guy called Klaus Masuk. Mm. That's Klaus spelled with a K. Masuk is uh, M-A-S-U-C-H. Klaus Masuk. Now, Klaus Masuk came to Ireland. He's a senior executive with the uh, European Central Bank. And he came to Ireland. He was, he was sent on a mission, basically, which was to obviously sort of you know, gauge the degree with which the Irish people had accepted the fact that they're, they're, they no longer existed as a nation. Um, and, and Vincent Brown you know, did a superb job of, of actually demonstrating that Klaus Masuk, I actually don't think Klaus Masuk understands the um, the mechanics of what's occurred here. I mean, he he was, you know, this is a guy earning at least six figures, more likely a seven-figure salary with the European Central Bank. And, um, you know, he, he tried to sort of blag his way through explaining why it was that the Irish taxpayer had to accept all this responsibility for all these toxic debts. And, uh, you know, Vincent Brown um, actually you know, nailed it. Um, and, and Klaus Masuk effectively refused to answer his question. But, you know, people need to look, because you, you're asking the right questions, Vincent Brown, who is mainstream, was asking the right questions, but your compliant media just rolls over and, um, you know, a, a, and prints whatever it is they're told to print by a, a ruling elite that, that is effectively uh, determined to ensure that there are a few people who are very, very well rewarded because they've effectively sold their soul and will do the elite bidding, and, and the rest of the people will either leave or die. You know, in this country, in the UK, where I'm speaking from right now, you know, the media, the mainstream media, is now full of articles where, you know, people are going into hospital, and it, and they're being put on what was initially called the death pathway, which pretty much sort of tells you what the deal is. But they realize that calling it the death path pathway was, uh, was a bit of a PR um, nightmare. So they changed it to the care pathway. And, and, you know, basically it means anything but. It's like the World Health Organization, which of course should probably be called the World Sickness Organization, because there ain't no money in health, but there's a shed load of money in sickness. And now, basically, what we're seeing, and what we have been seeing in the UK for the best part of the last two to three years, is, is a move towards euthanasia. And, and with the, the benefits being reduced, and eventually I mean, they will be taken away, um, I mean, just like they are in the US, you know, basically, if people can't afford the outrageous cost, if they're not on the corporate payroll, and not, therefore don't have um, an insurance, if they can't afford the, uh, the health care, then they basically die. And, and that's the way it's going to be in, uh, in the rest of the world within the next sort of, yeah, probably decade, maybe even less. And that's, that's the way it is in America now. If you don't have medical insurance, then obviously you can't, uh, get, you can't get treated. Ian, I have a couple of quick fire questions for you because we've got to keep an eye on the time as well. The two questions are, one involves Codex Alien uh, Alimentarius. I have it here. And uh, okay, um, and if you can, uh, it, what I'll do is you read out the Codex Alimentarius one, and I'll read the other one, and then Ian can take the two of them. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. Yeah, uh, Ian Mick, Mick, a uh, good good friend of ours at the show. He wants to know if we can ask Ian about Codex Alimentarius. 
Uh, is it in full swing now? Because Mick has said he has noticed the words on a pack of Pringles, but he hasn't seen it anywhere else. And he's wondering, does, uh, do you think that this has something to do with peop- that people are finding out what Codex is? And the second question, Ian, is obviously unrelated to that, and it's saying, Firebrand wants to know, can you ask Ian what happened to Edge TV? On the Edge is on at 6 o'clock in the morning, nothing but loaded and other rubbish. Looks like Mordock has taken the station back. So. Okay, uh, well, Codex Elementarius. Um, I, I mean, the Codex Elementarius agenda has been um, being being perpetrated for, well, 51 years, since 1961. Um, and yes, it is very much in force in the EU. Um, uh, I mean, a few years ago, of course, I recorded a presentation, I think it was 2007, I recorded a presentation where I was trying to explain uh, the Codex Alimentarius agenda, and I was explaining that basically this was the... Um, agenda being established by Big Pharma with a PH and Big Pharma with an F by the biotech industry. And the nature of the, uh, of the agenda was to effectively eradicate all natural farming uh, and so basically allowing the biotech industry, the GMO industry, to effectively take control of the, the, the global food supply. And then the, uh, um, in parallel with that, Big Pharma with a PH to effectively abolish all natural healthcare products. And when I presented that in 2007, the natural health community, the alternative health community, made it, oh, yo, that'll never happen. That's just a rampant conspiracy theory. And then when the independent newspaper, uh, the national paper that is, ran an article in December of 2010 announcing that with effect from May of, May the 1st of 2011, it would start the two year period by which all natural health products within the EU either had to be approved, this is Napoleonic law, or removed from sale. Now, you know, this is very, very significant as far as um, the UK and uh, Ireland are concerned because the British law is based on common law. In other words, everything is legal unless it is, unless it is specifically made illegal, um, and, and that, which is the way it is in Europe. And this is called the Napoleonic law or civil law. And consequently, what it meant was that whereas uh, um, up until May the 1st, 2011, you know, all natural health products, unless specifically banned, they could be put on sale, and there was no particular licensing uh, process in place. I mean, obviously, if something proved to, um, to have negative health effects, you would expect it to be removed from sale. Although, of course, that isn't the case with uh, the pharmaceutical industry. But anyway, the bottom line is that uh, we are now just um, four months and a couple of days away from May the 1st in 2013. And on May the 1st, 2013, the EU legislation, which has the acronym of SUMP, uh, which is the Traditional Herbal Medicines Products Directive, takes full force and all unapproved natural health products will have to be removed from sale in, um, in the EU. And anybody found selling an unapproved product will be treated as though they were selling a Class C drug. And, and of course, the reason that natural health products have been targeted is because natural health products are, are taken not for a cure, although sometimes, you know, they may have beneficial um, effects on somebody suffering from something. But primarily, natural health products are about prevention. And the pharmaceutical industry does not want people preventing themselves from getting sick. Because like I said before, there's no money in health. There's a shed load of money in in fitness. And as I've said for many, many years, the pharmaceutical industry has a very, very simple business model. And that is that every human life form is a potential revenue stream from the moment of conception to the moment of death. And the sooner that the pharmaceutical industry can get people onto that um, revenue stream, the better they like it. And of course, the reality is the pharmaceutical industry is the biggest killer on the planet. More people die every year from taking properly prescribed pharmaceuticals. That's pharmaceutical products uh, um, being prescribed by the medical profession 
uh, based on you know effectively what is written on the um, uh, on the specification for those products. But more people die from taking properly prescribed pharmaceuticals than ever from firearm incidents or road traffic accidents or wars or terrorism. You know, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, of course, is protected, particularly in the in the U.S., where it is absolutely illegal for anybody to mount any action against the pharmaceutical industry because they believe that um, they have suffered any negative health effects. And of course, uh, for the people that have died, their relatives can't take any action against the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, what tends to happen is if the pharmaceutical industry starts to get wind of, um, you know, some negative effects from a drug that they've put out, they very quickly go around and, um, and, and pay money uh, you know, hush money, basically, to the people, not admitting liability, of course, but they pay hush money to uh, just get the whole thing covered up. Um, and, and, you know, in the biotech industry, you know, when you think 22 years ago, there wasn't a single acre on the planet that was dedicated to GM foods that would go into the food chain. And, and yet here we are today, um, and in the U.S., pretty much the whole of the food chain is contaminated by GM. In fact, in the U.S., you can actually label something as organic if it has 10% contamination. I mean, just to show you how ridiculous that is, in the EU, uh, um, uh, if anything, the maximum level of contamination is 0.17%. If anything is contaminated by more than 0.17%, it cannot be labeled as organic. But, uh, you know, basically this is, this is why there is such a, a thrust to, um, to get GM uh, products into countries around the world. I believe that India has stated that it will not tolerate any GM products on, on, its, uh, on its soil. Uh, um, and, and that's really because of, primarily because of the horrendous experience that they've had with Monsanto's BT cotton, which has led to literally hundreds of thousands of Indian cotton farmers committing suicide over the last 15 years. The reason they commit suicide is because you know, they end up being so indebted because Unlike um, a normal plier, you know, if they, if they sell you a Duff product, then you either get a refund or you get a replacement. Not with Monsanto. They just say, basically, tough shit, boys. Um, you're going to have to uh, buy another set of seeds. And it's tell you what will lend you the money to, to buy them. Uh, and because the seeds don't yield, because the farmers aren't able to recover even their, uh, their costs, they end up with phenomenal levels of debt. And uh, in, in this part of India... I'm not sure whether it's actually the law or, or it's just custom. But if somebody dies of natural causes with massive debts, then the debts pass on to their descendants. Whereas if they commit suicide, the debt is effectively uh, nullified. And so consequently, you know, a lot of these Indian farmers, literally hundreds of thousands of them, in fact, there's a New York State University that published a report in April of 2011, I believe it was, and in that report, they stated categorically, they said one Indian cotton farmer commits suicide every 30 minutes. Wow, so, Jesus. So, you know, people, people need to, to wake up. Like you said, the NIMBY not in my backyard. Just because it doesn't impact them doesn't mean to say that, uh, you know, it, it, it's not going to impact them at some point. And the bottom line is people you know, really either wake up to this or what they are doing is they are certainly condemning their children and their grandchildren to, um, well, I, I, I think potentially lives of absolute abject economic slavery, at, at best, uh, and potentially a, um, a lot, lot worse. Oh. So, you know, the Codex Alimentarius agenda is, is just one more thing to be very, very uh, concerned about. And I would encourage people once again to go uh, um, and do a little bit of research for themselves. Definitely. I think we had the article in the newspaper over here where the, I think, was it the revenue or some group, the government is given access to some group so they can come into your house and check your fridge to make sure there's no bacteria for food poisoning. Did you see that in no. the paper? Yeah. That's not genuine. That's genuine. Well, it was in the, well. It was it, in the newspaper. It was so in it the newspaper. <laughs> it, must, it must be true. But imagine. Well, you know, I haven't heard that, but I mean, it, it doesn't surprise me. And. I mean, ultimately, of course, where these guys are going is total control. I mean, it is, they've been writing about this for um, 80 odd years. Um, you know, in fact, we can, we can trace the, uh, the control agenda 
Um, I, I mean, even before George Orwell, you know, to a, a book that was written called Technocracy Inc. back in the 1930s, and one of the authors of that was a guy called Marion King Hubbard, uh, who uh, became a member of the Club of Rome. And, you know, Zbigniew big new Brzezinski. He's been the champion of this technocracy agenda for the last 50-odd years. And, you know, where these people want to go is total control, the total monitoring um, of every facet of every individual's life. And, and, you know, we haven't got the time to get onto the subject, but, of course, you know, smart meters are a big part of, of this agenda. Mm. But before, before I, I, I sign off with you guys, um, to answer your question about edge media, I mean, first of all, let me make it very clear that uh, I really haven't had very much, well, I've had nothing to do with edge media, basically, for the best part of the year. Um, you know, uh, but it was very evident that there was no possibility of the alternative community providing any kind of sufficient levels of resource to maintaining the channel. So, you know, the guy who owns the channel, um, the guy who actually holds the uh, the channel license, um, I believe, is also the owner of Loaded Magazine. And, uh, you know, so he is using um, the channel to promote Loaded TV. Now, you know, obviously, if people don't like the content, as with all things, you know, people have the opportunity to change the channel or, or turn it off. Um, you know, uh, I participated in some interviews with um, Aussie Beach TV. Now, Aussie Beach TV is a very light-hearted uh, channel. It's mainly web-based, but it's also broadcast into clubs and casinos throughout Australia. And, uh, yeah, I mean, all of the interviewers are, um, uh, shall I say, scantily clad, good-looking women. Yeah, we've seen the photos in. Anybody, <laughs> I'm not sure that anybody actually listens to anything that's being uh, discussed. But nonetheless, you yeah. know, um, uh, if people Google Aussie Beach TV and Ian Crane, Aussie Beach TV, uh, you'll see a couple of the interviews that I did with them. I mean, basically, over about a period of four hours, they grilled me on a whole range of subjects. And the, the whole objective was that over the next year or so, they'll break those interviews down into bite-sized chunks and just incorporate a few minutes of those interviews into the Aussie Beach TV program. And, and I know that, um, you know, the guys who run Edge Media, you know, their thinking is that, um, okay, yeah, sure, they're going to upset a number of uh, their traditional viewers, if you like. But, uh, you know, if they can actually reach out to a new audience via Loaded TV, and a few of those people are still tuned in when they start broadcasting the, the Edge material, um, then, you know, maybe maybe they'll reach out to uh, an audience beyond, the, um, beyond just preaching to the choir. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, like all things, people have the, uh, the choice. They can switch off, change channel, or carry on watching whatever they want to do. No, I, I, I do. I agree with you on that. And uh, hopefully that answers the, um, the question for the listener. Now, did you notice, I know Ian is stuck for time and we're going to um, let Ian go there, but I, I now realise what the mistake is. If, if, we had, if we had a two-piece bikini on, Ian would stay in for three or four hours with us. Well, what's one? What, the, 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 the question I have to ask. Even that wouldn't cut it with you. <laughs> no, but uh, w- when you were doing these interviews, Ian, did you keep your shirt on? Oh, most definitely I did. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't want to scare the viewers away. Um, I mean, it was very casual. It, it was filmed up at a, in a makeshift studio uh, on the, the outside dining area of uh, a barren barbecue in Surfers Paradise. I mean, it was very relaxed. But let me tell you, I mean, out of these things, you know, you get some remarkable uh, things occur. Because whilst I was in that part of Australia, it was schoolies week. Now, schoolies is a bit like spring break, and it's where all of the uh, sort of 18-year-olds, um, having finished school, they go party. Um, and, of course, it's, it, it's big party time. Well, fortunately, this, the interviews were being recorded in the afternoon, so, uh, you know, most of the kids were still sober. But um, some, there was a group of young uh, people watching some of the videoing. And then when the, uh, we took a break, one of the young guys actually came up and started talking to me about 9-11. And it became very apparent that he'd actually done quite a lot of research about 9-11 for himself. But he was asking a few quite detailed questions. 
And one of the camera crew realised that this could actually make some pretty interesting TV. And so he filmed that discussion for the next 15, 20 minutes or so. And, and at some point over the coming year, because the, the young lad actually signed the, um, the disclosure to allow that uh, interview to be broadcast, so at some point during the course of the next year or so, that impromptu discussion with this you know, young Australian lad uh, will be broadcast. And I, I think it does go to show that whilst Australia is, is very much a party culture, uh, which is a you know, big problem because um, we don't have the time to talk about it right now, but I mean Australia is being screwed in a very, very similar way uh, to that which Ireland is being screwed. And I, I predict that you know, within probably two or three generations, I mean, Australia will be almost un uninhabitable. I mean, it's being turned into the, the world's mine, and it's just going to be a, you know, a, a chain of uh, communities around the coastline, effectively <coughs> dormitory towns for the extraction industry. But, you know, um, because it's, a, it's pretty much a laid-back culture, a bit like Ireland, I guess, in some ways, mm -hmm. but it's a very laid-back culture. But, you know, nonetheless, this interview, with, with this discussion with this young 18-year-old, uh, showed that there are an increasing number of people who are not just out there for the good time, uh, for the party. You know, they are actually taking um, an interest in what's occurring. And I think this is what is scaring the, um, the establishment. It's why they're trying to accelerate their agenda. And Zbigniew Brzezinski, of course, a couple of years ago, um, in, in a presentation to the Council on Foreign Relations, which people could find on YouTube, and in that presentation, he made the observation, he said, the biggest obstacle to establishing the one world government is the rapid political awakening of the masses. Which is happening now. <clears throat> Absolutely. So, you know, yes, we've got a long way to go. Uh, I mean, let's not get, um, let's not get uh, you know, carried away. Um, we've got a long way to go, but let's not get despondent, because the reality is that you know, more and more people are waking up. The, the great tragedy is that unfortunately there's probably got to be a lot more pain before people actually do wake up to the full magnitude of what's occurring but you know hey listen you know, guy what you're doing with oim and you know what i do and what everybody else uh, you know in the truth movement even people that not you know wouldn't label themselves as part of the truth movement but people who are starting to realize that unless they actually do take an interest in what's occurring then the legacy that they're leaving their children and their grandchildren ain't exactly one that they're going to be proud of. Totally. I totally agree with you there. Ian, I know we're stuck for time with you and you've other okay. things to do there. But listen, a big uh, thank you for coming on. I'm just going to pass you over to Steve and uh, let Steve do the roundup with you there. Ian, again, yeah, thanks very much. It's been uh, very, very enlightening as always. And uh, a couple of a load, a load of nice comments uh, thanking you coming in on the chat box there as well. Um, there was a couple of questions that say I know we're out of time. We didn't get to ask you, but there was a couple in relation to Nikola Tesla death ray on the twi on twin towers. Uh, someone else, uh, Lord Vapor, was also wondering about the uh, will will the powers that be bringing ho bring in hoarding laws such as those in the French Revolution, where if they prevent people from hoarding food, and uh, that's obviously where if uh, further down the road when Codex kicks in. So I mean, yeah, it's probably going to happen. Um, but yeah. Uh, just, just in closing, in uh, I'll leave the last few words to you. But if you could throw throw in your your website there as well, and any other um, means where people can find out more about you and and your work as well, that'd be great. Okay, um, actually, um, I'm I'm just in the process of getting my uh, speaking dates together for the for 2013. Um, through certainly through February, March, and April, I'm going to be focusing on the fracking issue. Um, I, you know, the good news is that more and more people are starting to realize how uh, literally, potentially deadly this is. Um, but the date for that will be on my website, which is uh, ianrcrane.com. That's I-A-N-R-C-R-A-N-E, ianrcrane.com. Um, but I would also like to mention, I mean, I am the UK publisher for two outstanding magazines. These are magazines that are produced in New Zealand. They're edited in New Zealand. But they are amazing publications. They, they are truly global publications. Uh, one is Uncensored Magazine. Uh, it's a hundred pages, a quarterly publication. And the reason that um, uh, I publish it in the UK is because, uh, you know, when the editor gave a couple of back issues to me a year ago and 
I was reading these magazines and I thought, you know, there is stuff in here that I wasn't aware of and, and that they are truly um, uh, informative, educational, and, and they're pre it's producing information that, uh, you know, you're not going to be reading in the mainstream media anytime soon. That's Uncensored Magazine and people can and order that via uncensoredmag.co.uk. And then the sister publication is the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine. Now, um, at the moment, um, you know, it, it, we're using, we're keeping the title New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine because with the Codex Alimentarius agenda, if I published it just as the Journal of Natural Medicine, I would run the risk of being shut down because event, uh, effectively I'm going to be um, publishing articles which, uh, if people followed up, would be prospectively illegal within the EU. But by publishing it as the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine, I can simply publish it on the basis that I'm just sharing what's going on in New Zealand. But, you know, the, the absurdity is that the information that is contained within that publication is, is literally thousands of years old in some cases. You know, and this is the knowledge and this is the information that the global corporatists are trying to destroy. They want people to be totally dependent on the corporatocracy. And, and, you know, this is information that is, is absolutely essential that, uh, you know, we keep alive. You know, we're, we're, we're in grave danger of, um, of unwittingly permitting uh, a global event that was first perpetrated perhaps in uh, 415 AD when the Cyrillian monks destroyed the Library of Alexandria. You know, that was the Library of Alexandria, and that's what put us into the Dark Ages you know, and as I said earlier, you know, we started to come out of the Dark Ages in 1820 when Jean-Francois Champollion deciphered the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And, and since then, you know, more and more of this ancient knowledge and ancient wisdom has been returned to us. And, uh, you know, that certainly we, we absolutely cannot lose this wonderful repository of information regarding natural health care. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't call it alternative health. The alternative health industry is the pharmaceutical industry, the one that's trying to kill everybody mm. and actually doing a pretty damn good job of it. You know, we've, we've got to uh, resort to the um, knowledge and information that's been around for literally millennia. So that's the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine and the website for that is nznaturalmed.co.uk. Well, nznaturalmed.co.uk. Do you have any dates yet, just quickly, in, uh, regarding um, talks in Ireland? I ha in, Northern, in Ireland, no. Um, in fact, I, I mean, I'm getting a lot of inquiries from people asking me, uh, you know, when I'm going to come back to Ireland. And, um, you know, if there, if there is sufficient interest, then, um, yeah, I, I'd love to come back. I, I love the Irish people. It, 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 it grieves me. It absolutely grieves me that the Irish people have been um, uh, duped into giving away their nation. And, you know, as, as many uh, people uh, who have come to my talks in Ireland will know, I'm a great admirer of Raymond Crotty, and, and I believe that, you know, this is an Irish hero that, uh, you know, I, I hope that the contribution that Crotty uh, has made becomes much more widely known amongst the people of Ireland than it, than it is currently. But it's like, it's like all things, I suppose, you know, visionaries are never acknowledged in their home country, and, and Crotty was certainly a visionary, because, you know, 30 years ago, he was trying to tell the Irish people uh, what was in store for them if they sleepwalked into this EU nightmare. Well, I think you have put Raymond on the map, in because I never heard of him, and I'm sure a lot of people didn't. I was until just you, thinking, yeah, thing, yeah. Well, I never, heard of, never him. heard of him until you start talking about him. Um, and so it's it's a thanks to you that you've you've told us about this guy. Now we did see you in Dundalk. You were in Dundalk with Jim doing a talk, and myself and Steve went along. I mean, you were there, and again, great talk, great information. Uh, from you so obviously as soon as you have the dates for Ireland if you can email us and let us know and we'll get, start advertising for you on OAM because I think it's important that people come along to your talks because the information is changing all the time ok will do brilliant Ian ok just stay with us there Ian we're just going to a musical break and we'll be back after this this is Open Your Mind Radio on OIMIreland.com cnsradio.ming.com and icradionetwork.com Give us a call on 
And we are back. John Parr St. Elmo's for I love that song. That's why I keep playing it. Um, that was an absolutely fantastic interview with Enoch Crane. Uh, uh, Alan and I have met Ian a couple of times, and he is a genuinely nice guy. I think we actually, there should be an interview with Ian. Is it up on the archives on our way on a vi- video interview? It's on the YouTube channel. It is on the, oh, on the YouTube, yeah. Uh, we had a, a great little interview with Ian there a couple of, it must be 2010 at this stage, but genuinely nice guy, full of, of great information. If, if anyone's finger is on the pulse of what's going on, uh, Ian R. Crane is, is that guy. Yeah, definitely. Really nice guy. Loads of information there from Ian. And getting the information out there, obviously being in the truth movement or wherever, some people have a different put a different name on it, a different spin on it, but trying to get the information out there, trying to wake people up. It's a full time job. I don't know about you, Steve, but no, it is I only a do a part time job. I only do a part time. Well, you're doing the part time now, I'm now that you have a baby. I'm going to timeshare or something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was brilliant. I, I think what we'll do is probably try and have a chat with Brian uh, Gerrish and get Brian on and talk a bit more about what he what he's been up to. We'll have to get Brian on sometime. Yeah. Um, Great, just, just a touch, just based on something real quick that Ian actually mentioned during the interview uh, in relation to the Vatican City and the age of consent. Now, this is something I hadn't actually heard of before until it must be, I'd say, probably the best part of a year and a half ago. And uh, to give him his dues, it was actually Vin on a TNS. Uh, both Alan and I were, were up in, in Vin's uh, house. Uh, shooting the breeze and having uh, copious cups of tea and coffee but uh, it was actually Vane he drew a diagram on a piece of paper and kind of explained everything and when you kind of seen when I seen those dots being joined together it it all made sense obviously go do your own research uh, for those who who don't or disbelieve it but it it did actually say or Vin did actually say when you make your, your confirmation in the Catholic Church uh, when you're born, you're given a name, you're assigned a name by your parents. But when 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 you're uh, making your confirmation, see me, that's a sign of you. You have now entered adulthood, and as such, you are, you can pick your own name. And obviously, the age of consent uh, it, it kind of follows suit. And it it seems to be genuine that it is twelve. The age of consent in the Vatican City. That's so un- it's unbelievable. It is un- unbelievable, and there's so much information out there. There's so many things going on that it's impossible for one person to know everything that's going on. And every day, at least nearly every week, we get a a revelation that opens up something, another Pandora's box, which might contradict what you obviously know. Now, I just want to have a quick chat about the whole belief system thing. Because, again, myself and Steve are always saying, we have a fluid belief system. It takes the ego out, okay, and it means that you're open to changing what you know. So it's important that you'd start developing a fluid belief system because you can take on board more information and you can assimilate it to uh, mention the Borg, but you can assimilate it and you can take it on board. And you know what you know this week might change next week. Just take it on board. So when you hear something that goes against your belief system, you don't have to worry about it because there's no ego involved. You just say, oh, that's okay, that's interesting. I'll take it on board. You won't be challenging that person because, you know, in a fluid belief system, you won't need to challenge somebody. You know, you might question, you might, you know, as Aristotle said, the, the sign of an educated mind is a person who can uh, entertain an idea without accepting it. And I think that's important as well. To be able to entertain something and talk about it, but not necessarily accepting it, is a good sign of intelligence, as far as I'm concerned, to be able to to debate it. Too many people have closed minds. They're closed minds, they have a belief system, whatever that belief system is, because they've been conditioned. And when you start challenging their belief system, they just don't want to leave what they're in. They don't want to leave the matrix. That's really what it is. They don't want to leave the matrix. Now, I was talking to... JP Jordan Reed quickly in Wolf Spirit Radio. And apparently, there's a lady who, you know, people know the movies The Matrix and Terminator. And this is what JP was talking about. The person who, the woman who put this together, this idea of The Matrix and Terminator, is a woman called Sonia Barrett, apparently. And if you go on the internet and type in Sonia Barrett, you'll see her. Now, apparently, The Matrix and The Terminator were supposed to be one movie. Do you know that? Nope. The Matrix and the Terminator, the whole idea, if you think about the movie The Terminator, what's it about? It's about a young child, John Connor, and a Terminator sent back from the future to kill him. 
Mm-hmm. Because if they kill him, then they don't have the resistance, okay? Yeah. Now, put John Connor in as Neo in the Matrix. Okay. Okay, have a think about that, right? Yeah. John that, that Connor. That long coat's going to be way too long. Right? John Connor grows up to be Neo. He knows something's gone on, but he doesn't know what it is. And then um, Morpheus, he meets Morpheus, and Morpheus says, you know what's going on, but you don't, just can't put your finger on it. And then he tells him about really, you know, what the situation is and what the, the Matrix is. So, apparently this lady, Sonia Barrett, wrote The Matrix and The Terminator to be one movie, but they were separate. Now, this is what JP was talking to me about, and we are having a chat about it. So, if you're interested in finding out more about this, there's also a guy on the internet, and for the life of me, I can't remember his name, but he actually breaks down The Matrix movie bit by bit, the whole plot and what's behind it, and the meaning behind it, which I found very interesting. So, again, it's a YouTube video, so if you type in Matrix plot or whatever, I'm sure you'll find it on YouTube. But that was interesting as well, um, to um, to look at that and see what you had to say about it. Now, I'd be interested, as I say, getting Brian on to talk about the whole Jimmy Savile thing, because more and more people are coming out, the Harry Harmon thing, and people are being... Uh, I think there's another person that was a 60 year old I think they were released, I'm not too sure there's another person um, arrested there just before Christmas in the 60s and I'm not too sure who the person was but I'm sure there's going to be more but they're just trying to reduce the risk of themselves being caught so they're actually throwing out a few red herrings and they're throwing out a few people to be caught lower down the, the ladder the rung of the ladder so the actual trail doesn't go up to the top and we know it's got to do with royalty and for you people who have actually seen Unlawful Killing the movie that was on the internet you know it does ask an awful lot of questions as to the royals and their involvement in the killing of Princess Diana and Dodie Alfied uh, Dodie is it Alfied or Fied? Ah uh, whatever Morphy Dodie Morphy Dodie Morphy <laughs> <laughs> So that was uh, an interesting movie all the same very interesting movie but, um, so yeah, so check it out. Now, as we were saying, we have the Radio Marathon on January the 12th over at unitedwewin.me and we'll be on there. More than likely, we might be producing. If not, we're going to be on the show anyway. So if you can pop over there and lend the support, tune in, ask any questions you want. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, Wild Hunt is on there. Great. Mark Pazazzo, P-A-S-S-I-O, is the chap. And Andy's put up the the YouTube link there in their chat forum. So if people want to um, click on that and have a look at that, it's very, very interesting. The other thing as well, there was a couple of, oh, a couple of people who asked questions on TNS and our chat facility that we didn't get a chance to um, give them to Ian to talk about. We had limited time, so sorry about that if we didn't get to your questions. But it's just limited there. That's right, yeah. Unlawful Killing was Al Fayed, yeah, that's right. And it was banned in the UK, so I wonder why, says yeah, that's, he. That's the one that uh, keeps disappearing off the internet, isn't it? It keeps popping up on, on various sites, and then it kind of ha- hangs around for a while, and then it's removed by uh, uh, YouTube. Exactly, yeah. It keeps. Well, I'm sure there's copies floating around the place. If people ask the right questions, I'm sure they'll, they'll oh, be able to find pe- one. If people ask the right questions to the right people, yeah. I'm sure, um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll find it knocking around somewhere, you know. But um, <clears throat> now, if you, anybody wants to come in, we have a little bit of time. So if you want to phone in or you want to Skype in, oam.ireland is the Skype address. And you want to give us uh, any information or an update or anything like that, by all means, uh, you can do that. Or even just comment on something that you've heard. Maybe you want to agree with something. Maybe you want to disagree with something. But well, you know, we we've, we've got half an hour. It's not it's not, it's not kind of uh, often that we have, we do have some time at the end of the show. Normally, the guests kind of run up to about a, a quarter a quarter to the hour, and then we have a few announcements. But um, yeah, if anyone wants to come in, we'd love to hear from you. Wouldn't so we? yeah, definitely. So if you want to come in now, if anybody hears anything more about this fridge thing, first of all, they're saying that the property charge they're going to try and get the money from your salary. Yeah. All right. No, 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 no. From your bank account. From your bank account. Sorry. Yeah. From your bank account. Um, and also, then this other thing that was in the Independent or one of these m- mainstream newspapers, 
about the people coming to your house. Mm-hmm. To check your fridge to make sure there's no bacteria in it because there's uh, you know a lot of cases of food poisoning apparently. Mm-hmm. So they want to go and check your fridge, and I thought, well, there's nobody going to be coming in my house checking my fridge. I can tell you that now. Well, probably the same as mine. If they if they did come in and check it, they'd uh, they'd open the door and they'd, they'd see the back of the fridge because there wouldn't be too much else. It's it's never full anyway. No, definitely not. But uh, I think uh, look, we said before, it's all about contract, and I think I've Harry from we the people to thank for that. That's kind of anytime anyone asks me a question, the first thing that comes into my head is. Are they trying to contract with me? I think everything's about contract. Someone knocks on your door and asks you a question. You have to think, if I if I answer this this question, am I contracting with them in some in some way, shape, or form? So I mean, that's that's kind of my well, it's in the forefront of my mind at all times. Don't don't ask or sorry, don't don't answer questions on, unless I'm talking to a friend or a friend or family. But I mean, if it's just someone knocking on your door, hi, we're here from the the the, the HSE, which is the Health and Social Health and whatever it is, executive here in the Republic of Ireland. I can't even think of the name. HSE, what's the answer? HSE. HSE. Health, health Safety health. Executive. Is it? Health, health and Safety uh, Executive. Okay, whatever, yeah. Yeah, okay. But yeah, if, they, if they knock on your door with their, their, their little name tag and the clipboard and the high-vis jacket, hello, we're from the HSE. Uh, can I ask you your name, please? What would you say? Well, I know, actually, don't, don't answer that. You can't say <laughs> that. I know what you'd say. Um, but, you know, you'd probably find some people that would be intimidated by that. And just because that they're there in, in an official capacity, uh, a lot of people wouldn't know that they don't have to let them in. There's no contract in place. So you can just say, I'm sorry, uh, I don't recognize you on your bike. Have a nice day. You know. Definitely. Now, I was speaking to a guard over the Christmas. And unfortunately, oh unfortunately, the conditioning is working with the Gardaí because when I was telling him about James and Paul, remember we had James and Paul as a pre-record, they were arrested unlaw- right, yeah. unlawfully, right? And I was telling the guard about this and the guard said to me that we think everybody should have an ID card because that will make it easier for for us. You know, like he, he said, well, we ask them people their name. We I want to know if them people what the names are and if they're local because if they're not local, if they come from a different place and they go and rob your house a few hours after, then you'd be screaming at us saying, How come they robbed your house? So the whole idea of them asking for people's names and where they're from is to um is to work out whether they're locals or whether they're from out of the town and they're there to actually commit a crime. Now, I can understand the logic in that, okay? I can understand the logic in that. Um, by the way, I think he, I think he, he seen me as a do-gooder, right? Mentioning, you know, I'm obliged and demand and constitution and all that kind of stuff. And um, he said, yeah, he said, if they went off and robbed your house now, you'd be giving out to us. And I kind of said, well, to be honest with you, you know, I don't make the law. The law is there for a reason. The law that I have to apply to is the law that you have to apply to. And I don't make the law. And if it says in the law that, uh, I think there's the Public Order Act, Section 24, the seven lines. And if they think you've committed a crime, then they, they you are obliged to give them your details. But if you ask them, have I committed a crime, they go, no. Then obviously you're not obliged to give them your details. that makes sense to you? It makes perfect makes, sense. It makes sense to me. Yeah. But yeah... These guards, and I'm sure if a guard came up and said, um, just want to get your details, lads, you know, there's a lot of crimes in the area and we're just checking, are you local here or are you from outside the town or whatever. If they kind of did that approach, and I'm sure all of us would go, oh, no problem, guard, you know, no, we're locals here. And they go, oh, fine, okay, have a good night. If they took that approach with people, you know, it would be, a lot of more people wouldn't mind doing it, I think, because their, yeah. job, their job is hard enough. But for guards just to pull up and go, what's your name? You know, that's going to put somebody's back up straight away. So I do think they need to do some customer service training courses and be nice to people. And maybe they'll get the information they want. And so that's that's important too. But the conditioning is working because he wants everybody to have an ID card. He thinks it would be a good idea. Now, obviously, he doesn't know what's going on with the bigger picture. Now, if we lived in a society which actually worked quite well, I wouldn't mind having an ID card. But we know the society we live in is being controlled by a group of elite people. 
So that's why I'm against your ID card. If that wasn't the case, then I wouldn't mind having an ID card. So that's really the issue. And so, unfortunately, I tried, um, but the conditioning was just too much. And he's probably just one of many. I mean, I'm not saying, we're not, obviously, we, we don't tire people with, with a brush, and we certainly don't tire everyone with the same brush. But, I mean, obviously, he got into the job for different reasons, so therefore he was easier to program, if you like. Maybe some people get into the job, and they just want to be there to protect and serve, and to keep the peace and maintain the peace. And may, maybe the, the, the do you remember the, the, the guards years ago? Like they kind of patrol the streets, and they were kind of they see a group of kids, and they go over, they interact with the kids, yeah, yeah. And it was you know, he was the friendly neighbourhood guard, but maybe the criminals, I don't know, maybe it was just too much for them. But come here, they just just want to comment on something that Bluebell has written there. Uh, have you seen the new European driving license that becomes law in January? We spoke about this. Uh, was it last week or, or possibly a fortnight ago? I think it was last week actually. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I actually got a notification in the door from from the Department of Driving Licenses or whoever the hell they are. But uh, it was mentioned that when you get your driving license, it costs, well, let's say it costs X euro. But uh, once these new ones come in, it's going to cost X, Y, Z euro. Uh, because they're not going to be kind of done on the paper. It's going to be the new credit card style like the American one you see in the, the American TV shows. And they did say in the information leaflet that came in the door that it's going to be uh, each one is going to be handmade so therefore it'll be less like of copying and duplication and all this sort of carry on and they're going to be so secure and blah 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 and the whole time I was reading the information that came uh, the the one thing that kept coming into my head was RFID 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 so therefore everything that they, they know about it was probably going to be more than likely starting this RFID chip and of course then the, the question popped up in my head if when my driving license expires, if I if I have to uh, get one of these new ones, and if if it does have an RFID chip, I mean, if, if it's going to be used, you know, if, if you're stopped at a checkpoint and you say, "Can I look at your driving license?" You go, "There you go, guard, have a look at that." Um, but if it's going to have information about me stored on an RFID chip, well, I don't really want that. That's not something that I'm kind of too comfortable with for various reasons. Not that I'm a criminal, um, but. You know, if you were to maybe cut out the RFID chip or stick it in the old microwave and, and uh, blow up the RFID chip, would, would that be okay? Well, funny enough, I've been having uh, a bit of fun uh, explaining to people about the technology, the RFID chip, on these new bank cards that are being released by the banks. And the RFID, if you, if you want to have a look at a, your credit card or your debit visa card, it's a white signal. The RFID logo is a white signal. And if you have a credit or laser card with a white kind of signal on the card, that means it has RFID. And I've been talking to people and demonstrating to people how the card can be swiped using a smartphone and some software. Using a new technology on the smartphones called NFC, which is Near Field Communication. Ah, you're making this up. No. Come on. No. And um, I've been showing people. And basically, I showed... Um, as I say, a member of the family, um, uh, a member of the extended family, is in, involved with the guards, and I put it on his phone and showed him how it worked. And basically, he couldn't believe it. And he's educating people, and I've been going around showing people about the cards. Now, when I did get a phone call off, off one of the banks, and the lady who rang me from the bank said, "Oh, that's too technical. I'll get the fraud team to give you a ring." And I said, well, that's fine, no problem at all. I can be hired as a consultant for the bank, so I don't mind. But guess what? The fraud team didn't ring from the bank because if they did ring me, technically speaking, they'd be ag agreeing with me that there is a fault. They'd be, you know, so don't, they really yep. don't want to ignore it. So, um, well, I should say they, they are ignoring it because they know that if they ring me that they'd be agreeing that there's a fault. So for oh, if you can all check your credit cards and your, lebit, your laser debit cards, and it, it has, if it has an RFID tag in it, I would suggest you give it back into the bank and ask the bank to issue a card without the RFID. Yeah, and only because, as Alan has said, and we've seen this information on uh, a, a YouTube a video from a chap who'd done it, and since then, that kind of uh, lit the fire under Alan. He's done a bit of research into it, and as I say, he has, he's, he's, he has demonstrated it himself. But this new technology, it's on the some of the new smartphones. I think it's also on a games console as well. I'm not sure what game. It's probably a Nintendo something or other. Not 100% sure. 
but it, it does have the technology whereby your credit card details, if you do have one of these RFID chips, it would have to be an active RFID chip. There are passive ones as well. But if it's an active RFID chip and someone someone only has to be within a, a meter, that's three feet. So someone could be standing on a bus, on a queue, which you, any, anywhere at all, they could have a smartphone and they can actually be scanning around and accumulating credit card uh, details. They have to change that card. The banks have to change the card. The trouble is, when you go up to the tellers in the bank, look, they don't even know about fraction reserve banking. They won't even know about the RFID card and the fact you can do it. But I've been in touch with the company in the States who actually wrote the software. Now, this software can be written. I mean, I can guarantee that in the criminal world that this software is available or a very different variations of this software is available. That can be done. And the signal... Because it's on the smartphone, the signal isn't that good. But there are, you can use RFID card swipe machines in a portable way, which increases the signal. The NFC signal range is about three feet. So they don't even have to be standing right beside you. They could just walk past you. And if you have one of these cards... Now, if you have one of these cards uh, and you want to protect it for the moment, just get tin foil and wrap it in tin foil. Um, there are um, sleeves that you can get, which I'm hoping to try and get some from this company in the States, and then we'll make them available, just for a small fee, for people who want to buy them, who want to put the cards in it. But I would recommend you go and, and sort out your card, because <laughs> you could go into a coffee shop, and before you finish your coffee, your card could be swiped and used before you finish and leave the, leave the shop. It's that easy to, to, to do it. You just... You know, move your move the phone or move the actual RFID reader over your bag, your wallet. Could be in a, a tube station, you could be in a bus station, waiting, and they, all you have to do is stand beside you, and it's taken. So just you know, something to be aware of. Yes, good information. Uh, just a, a question there from Bluebell about the uh, property tax. How do you, how so? How do you get around this? I'm not paying the property tax. Well, from what we've heard, that there are there are uh, there is a company. Um, or I'm not a company there's a, a group in existence now and I can't think of the name off the top of my head it's a probably property tax or ye or whatever the, whatever the name is but they're saying that if anyone if there are any prosecutions they will go to court with people but what we're saying um, um, information we've heard from Harry on a previous show I think it's uh, probably uh, a couple of couple, a good few shows back and um, what Harry was saying is it's all about contract um, when people send you out the notification, or they, they they knock at your door and say about this property tax, and uh, they they you know want to get your details to say, well, oh, I'm not paying it. Well, okay, well, you're not paying it. Well, can we just have your name for the? Uh, can you you know just give your name? Anyway, <clears throat> once you give them your name, you've you've technically contracted. Um, and I mean, once once you've contracted, they can start kind of sending you out the summons and all that, but. As Harry always says, return to sender. Just put a return to sender sticker and just you know kind of send everything back. Um, if I don't know, I mean, subject matter jurisdiction is yeah, what you're talking it's about. Subject matter jurisdiction, yeah. Just just be aware of that. Before I go on to another subject, I just want to quickly say about the whole credit card thing. Banks don't really care that the cards are being used fraudulently. For the simple reason is, it's all about market share. If their credit cards are have the highest, highest highest percentage of usage from people, regardless whether they're it's corrupt or not, that it's good for their marketing statistics. So they don't mind, you know. So they're not really bothered whether your card gets you know um, swiped and used by somebody else, because as far as they're seeing it, if the card's being used, they get the market share, and that's what they're interested in. So just you know keep that in mind. Yeah, that's, what I, that's what's in the program on it, and this is what they were saying on the program. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm just saying, I'll say allegedly, just being the safe side, <laughs> but it was mentioned on the, the program. So that's kind of something like what you were saying, you said to me a long, long time ago, about a musician and publicity. Whether it's good publicity or bad publicity, it's publicity. publicity. If people are talking about you, you know, it doesn't matter what they're saying. Um, what I was going to say as well, about bank accounts, I, I actually toyed around with this, and I was just kind of speaking to my, my wife this evening, in relation to a bank account, and a bank account is a very, very uh, sorry. What led us on to this was we were saying about uh, the these property tax people that they're saying now, oh, we'll get into your revenue, we'll get into your bank account, and they will instruct your bank to give them the money. Of course, they cannot do that. I mean, that's 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 ridiculous. However, a bank account is a very, very handy and a convenient thing to have. Now, what if you? What if we just decided? Let's say everyone 
no, not even everyone. What if we all just got rid of our bank accounts? Well, we wouldn't stop. I mean, the world wouldn't stop. Uh, people who 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 are still you know had bills to pay or mortgage to pay. Well, you could just kind of get your money in, uh, you know, put into your credit union. Credit unions are, I think, well, in my opinion, a, a better bet. That's just for me personally. Mm. But if we if you had no bank account and I had no bank account, every month, let's say your mortgage was due. Can you, can you, you could just, as Harry often says, go up to the bank, slide the old washers across, and make out a lodge and say, can you lodge that into that account? Therefore, you're lodging in cash, so therefore, you don't need a bank account. Mm. Um, paying your bills, you could just walk into into the post office. I know you can do a lot. You can pay a lot of the bills through the post office, can't you? So you don't you don't need a bank account. No no need for direct debits. I think we need to start looking at doing something like this. I think we really need to. I mean, they have set the system up that makes it very difficult to do anything without a bank, bank account, but it's not impossible, and it just takes a little bit more effort. And I think with people struggling now with mortgages, and you know, Harry's idea, you know, it's totally agreed. I think I said last week about the woman who worked for the Merchant Bank, which I was talking to, and she said intent to perform a contract. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, yeah. you, must be work- you must work in the banking system. She said, yes, I used to work for a merchant bank. And she said the same thing. You know, give in what you can afford. Because when cases went to court, the, the first thing she said that the judge said was that how much was being paid. And, of course, the solicitor on the, the, the bank side was gone. But they were not paying blah, blah, blah. blah and, the, and the judge said, hang on a minute. Were they paying? Did they perform on the contract? Were they paying something? And the, the other sister said, yes, they were. And the judge said, well, then, that's okay, then. Now, it upset the bank, but at the end of the day, intent to perform a contract, paying something. And I suppose if you pay, you know, 120 one week and 110 next week or whatever you want to pay, if it's going up and down, it makes it look like you're making the effort. You know, if you pay £100, 100 pound a week, it doesn't look as if you're struggling, as if you were probably changing it. And that's just my opinion. Um, so 110 maybe one week, 120 one week, and maybe 90 another week. That looks like you're doing your best, you know, from a psychological point of view. So if you're going down that road, it might be a, a, not a good idea. And, you know, the way things are going at the moment with how things are going, you never know. Me and Steve might be going down that road as well. That's what we mentioned at Claire last week or the week that Claire was on. Yeah. I tell you, Claire, Claire is another woman, a, a Cork woman, full of great information. Uh, debt, debt, D-E-B-T, options is over Facebook and I think they also have the new website which launched as well I think it's debt, debtoptions.ie um, great information absolutely fantastic information <coughs> excuse me but yeah in relation to just, just uh, going back there I think it was uh, blah, 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 Bluebell said you need a bank account because my wages are paid into it well you don't actually need a bank account I mean you can you can as I said, as I mentioned uh, previously, a credit union, if there's a local credit union, okay, the, the downside is credit unions don't have ATMs and a lot of them are only open certain times and, you know, but you can, you, you can get your, your wages put straight into a credit union and you can, set, you can have all your direct debits set up from there. You know, so it's, it's not impossible to live without uh, an actual bank account. Can you get your salary paid into a credit union? I wonder will corporate, because, see, the corporate companies use a, a system called BACS, which is the bank's automated computer system. And I remember being involved in, with this years ago, where we used to have magnetic tapes. For those old of you, old enough to remember magnetic tapes. So we used to put all the information on the magnetic tapes, and they'd get shipped off to the bank, and the banks would actually process all the salaries and stuff, okay? Right. So, here's the thing. <coughs> I'm just wondering, would the back system... Or the, I suppose it depends on the company whether they can change the payment and have it paid into a credit union because it's not in the banking system as such. But well, my 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 question there would be, uh, it's not mandatory to have a bank account. So if you if you were in paid employment and your employer says, okay, um, we're going to pay you X Y Z per week or per month or per fortnight, uh, we're going to uh, we, we don't pay in cash, so we're going to pay you, it's going to be into your bank account. And if you say, well actually I don't have a bank account and here's the 101 reasons as to why I don't and will never have a bank account, well you're, it's up to your employer then to pay it in a different way. If, if that's maybe right in the company check, and then if, even if you go down if they won't lodge it into your bank account or your, sorry, your credit union account if, if the, your, your employer writes you a check every week Mm. And then you go down and you physically hand that check over. I'm doing the actions here as well. Yeah. <laughs> Into your credit union account. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's an idea, definitely, to have a look at it. Because, 
the so bank's got us into this bloody mess, and by, by us kind of going, oh, well, you know, she, you have to have a bank account. Well, no, you don't. It, it, it makes things very convenient. You know, it, it's, it's kind of nice and warm and knowing that you, you can just go to any ATM around the country and withdraw money when you need it. It's, it makes it bloody handy, yeah, I agree. However, you know, it's not, necess- it's not a necessity, as far as I'm concerned. When you kind of see that, you know, the bigger picture, and it's the banks got us into this mess. They're the ones who are screwing us over. Yeah. They're the ones who are repossessing people's homes. Mm. You know, they're less, it's like a troll, as they say. And you know when you're on these forums and they say, don't feed the trolls. You know, maybe if we stop feeding the banks, they might just go away. But it's not, the, it's not what they say. Banks are like having sex with a condom. You get the feeling, you get the feeling of security while being screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that before. There you go. Wow. And it is like sex because uh, when you withdraw, you lose interest. Oh. Okay, sorry, that's a bit oh, below the belt. but it's, then it's, it's below the watershed, too. <laughs> below the watershed, <laughs> before 9 o'clock. We're all adults here. That's it. So, there you go. That's you know another another show in the bag. Next week we have um, a few minutes. So next week we we'll, you can talk about what Vin is doing. I'm just going to talk about next week's show. Next week now everybody knows that we have we had Kevin Annette on the show talking about what he's talking about about the um, children that were being killed and abused and all that stuff in Canada in can, the Canada uh, Canadian schools. Well, some people believe that Kevin Annette. Is not who he is, or he shouldn't be doing what he's doing, and he's upsetting a lot of people as well. And it's only fair that we actually have somebody on giving their point of view from the opposite side. So we have a kind of balanced view on what's going on. So next week, we have a lady on called Heather Martin, and she's against Kevin and it and what he's doing. So we're going to get Heather on and we're going to be talking to Heather about why she's against Kevin and what he's doing and obviously getting the other side of the biscuit, so to speak, and see what she says. Also, what I'm planning to do as well is we actually got in touch with, I'm going to say, call him the Organite, Organite Man. Ooh. The guy in the video that we talked about, I was in touch with him. I had a Skype with him just before Christmas and I, I asked him to come on next week. I and mean, we're going to be talking about Organite and what's it all about and does it work? Who invented or who came across it? Apparently some German scientist or something in, in, you know, in the 40s and 50s came across Organite. So we just want to inquire about you know, what he's doing going around Ireland, putting Organite around the telephone mast, taking the negative effect off the mast. And obviously why he believes that it works or it, if he has any evidence to show that it works. The other thing that he talks about is chemtrail busters, which are copper pipes in sand in a bucket, something like that. Anyway, I've seen, I've and, seen these. And yeah. basically, they're pointed upwards, and they they actually get rid of the chemtrails. Apparently, yeah. I don't know how that works. So that's why we're going to be talking about. It. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen actually. There must be a, a, a year or so ago information uh, where he 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 done <coughs> the video on the uh, the chem the chem busters are. Yeah, it's it's a weird looking thing. It's it's you'd really, really, really have to have an open mind. If 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 you're if you're kind of into into science and technology whereby things work and you know how they work and you know when you look at this video you're kinda of going, Wow, you you really have to put that way at the back on the shelf somewhere because it's if if it does work as he says, there's no kind of rhyme or reason as to why it does. You know, it 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 doesn't really make a lot of sense. But we we should uh, not you know, scoff at these things. We should give them a go. Anyhow, we're going to be wrapping up here in a few minutes' time. And uh, for anyone who needs, uh, oh, who wants more of this great information and the the, the, the chat, uh, head on over to TNS, where Vin's guest this evening is Kevin West. Kevin is a filmmaker, and he has made a, a small fly on the wall documentary. No. He hasn't made a small fly. He's made a small fly on the wall documentary <laughs> with a portion devoted to TNS Radio. It will be released over the next month or two. So tune in and spread the word. And uh, Vin also said, don't forget to hit the Facebook share buttons. And um, yes, and, and a very happy Christmas to us. Well, thanks for that, Vin. It's a, li- it's a little bit late, but happy New Year to you and to everyone else and all the all the, the guests and all the listeners and all the, the other DJs on TNS and all the other you know true media uh, truth media stations. Yeah, for, the internet. for everybody out there, have a great New Year and be safe. Don't drink too much and have fun. And then we look forward to 
you know, let's let's kind of raise the bar for 2013. Let's start doing a bit more and waking more people up and make it, I mean, it is kind of like a job to a certain extent because, you know, here's, here's another thing I was kind of, kind of thinking about during the week and I, I want to get your take on it as well, uh, the listeners, and if you want to email us and let us know your thoughts. Okay. I find it very hard personally to... Um, yeah, I find that very hard. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> no, I, oh, it's going to be one of them. Like, oh, I find God. it. I find it very hard to actually be around people who are not open and awake. Okay. Now they talk about this conscious shift. It's a shift in consciousness. And I, I, I think I'm not saying I'm any better than anybody else. Or me and Steve are any better than anybody else. But I do believe that. The vibration that we vibrate on because we are awake is different to people who are not awake. And maybe that's why, you know when, you know, in Ireland people say, oh yeah, that guy gives me a bad vibe. Well, basically what you're doing is, you know, you're picking up in his, his energy, his vibration, okay? And I just think that when you are awake on, on what's going on, that your vibration does change. And maybe it does go higher, it might even go lower, I don't know. But definitely your energy and your vibration does change. And that change is just to be with like-minded people. And that's why maybe people can't be around, you know, people who have a closed mind and they're talking about Carnation Street and Crossroads and all these soaps and all the trivial stuff. Because personally, I can't really do that. And um, I don't know about Steve, I don't know about you, whether you, you can... No, I, th- I think, you know, my, my, my take on that is probably the same as your own. I used to be into that. Anyone who, who know it, well, probably not, not a lot of people listening now w- would have met me previously. But uh, yeah, I was kind of the one who watched Coronation Street, and if I didn't see it, I recorded it, and myself and the wife would sit down and watch the three or four episodes together. <coughs> Excuse me. And and a lot of that kind of it seemed it's actually seemed important, you know. And if you, if you didn't miss if if you missed an episode, you had nothing to talk about and work. And I see that all the time now that people I work with, uh, if it's not if it's not the football, it's other programs, and even the boss, like the guy I work for, he's a great guy. Um, salt of the earth, loving the bits, but even him, he comes in and he talks about TV programs and oh, he even says to me, oh, you should watch it. It's it's right up your alley. It's it's all about conspiracies and all that. And I go, well, John, if it's you know, I'd, I'd rather research and look into real, real, real kind of you know stuff that's going on rather than TV programs. I mean, don't get me wrong. I can I can sit down with the kids as well, throw on a DVD and and have a laugh and a joke with the kids and you know be entertained, but. The likes of Coronation you know, and all the soaps, I used, I actually found at one stage, I, I, I had been on night work for a while, for a week, I'd missed several episodes of Coronation Street, and when I sat down on Sunday, it was nearly like five or six hours to catch up on, and I, I remember saying to, to, to my wife, I can't do this, and she says, well, sure you, you won't know what's going on, and I says, well, it's not even reality, it's, it's makey up, it's make believe, mm. it's fantasy, it's not real. And I'm going to sit down and waste half a day catching up on on this stuff that's not real, that seems to be important in my life. And then I realised, it's not important. And it was like, at that point in time, I stopped watching it. And I thought, okay, how is this going to affect me? I won't be able to talk to people about Carnage Street and what's going on. and I'll be out of the loop. And do you know what happened? Nothing. Mm. Absolutely nothing. It didn't, it didn't affect me in one, uh, one iota. Mm. I couldn't tell you. I mean, I don't watch... I watch TV for documentaries and for comedy. Because comedy, laughter is always good for the soul and documentary. So, I don't know, this, that's just my uh, subjective opinion on energy. On maybe their conscious shift is when you wake up, that that's the shift you make and the vibration changes. So, I can't give you, I can't say it's objective because I haven't done any, any research and it. it's just subjective for myself. But if anybody else has any information on it, by all means, let us know, that'd be fine. I also got a letter from a lady, um, Jean, in London, who is a targeted individual. And boy, God, what she's gone through is unbelievable. The the uh, harassment and just, you know, it's unbelievable, these people who are targeted. So, again, we are looking at um, the one thing that we have to finish doing, Steve, is to we have to drive to the location that we talked about yes, we to do. check it for a scan. And <coughs> once we have it scanned and it's okay, then we can say to people, right, because I'm sure there's people out there, and I know one or two emails that we received who actually are waiting to be scanned. So we just need to check the location where we're talking about. And if it turns out okay, then we can start offering the scanning for people who feel that they, they want to be checked. 
and we'll probably have the video well I think we will have the video as well as, as to and give them a copy of the video this is the anal probe isn't it the anal probe <laughs> <laughs> the anal probe ok well listen it's got to that time so everybody have a great uh, New Year's <laughs> Eve take it easy don't drink too much don't eat too much and we'll be talking to you next week for myself Alan James Good night. ok thanks for that round up um, for myself as well Stephen George it's very very happy New Year uh, 2013 to every each and every one of you uh, so this we won't be able to do a Christmas message or a New Year message like the, the the British Queen does, but you know this is as good as it gets. Yeah, have a, have a great uh, New Year's Eve, and don't mind Alan. Drink as much as you want. The hangover will be worth it, and we'll do it all again next week. Take care. Bye bye. Okay,